Greetings citizens of YouTube and welcome back to my YouTube channel and welcome to another Starter Deck Mania Tournament. This time Chuck Yu is the one who built the deck. It will be a Death Starter Deck. I will show everyone the deck list that everyone must play. The format is rather simple. You must play a specific deck list. You cannot alter it in any way whatsoever. Best two out of three matches every single round. Well, it sounds simple, but then it got a little bit more complicated because this time they're trying to mimic the World Cup and they put everyone into different pods of groups. There were like 40-something groups and I was in one of the 40-something groups. So you play everyone in your entire group. Every group consists of four people and in theory, the top two from each group advance. Though with 40-something groups then that means everyone who finishes first place gets a buy into the round of 64, and some of the people who finish second place get a buy into the round of 64. Others have to play the round of 128. So that's the situation with regards to the mathematics behind the situation. There are some other things that I don't know what would happen, and I will talk about those at the end of this video. Some curiosities I had after playing my set. You're going to get to see my complete group stage set this match. So my group had three other people, so four people in total. One of the four was unresponsive, so there's only going to be two matches in this video meaning that we all got credit against that one person who didn't respond to any of us in the group. The other two people in the group did were very responsive, and all the three of us played each other in matches. So in theory, the top two people will advance to the knockout stage is how the group uh, stage works. And we will see how this goes on. I'm just going to go ahead and get right into the deck list and go from there. So here we see the deck list that you're required to play with in this tournament. As you can see on ladder, people have played it seven times and nobody has been able to win with it. So if you're watching this video and looking for something to win with on ladder, do not play this. If you're looking for something for comic value to laugh, point fun at, and watch a social experiment of two people playing the same very, very bad deck at each other, then this is the video for you. This is just an FYI so you can get a feel for what is to come. Uh, the good card is Blight Bomb in this deck. The cool thing about the Blight Bomb is for one mana, it can actually kill any creature in this list. Which is, is, is quite insane at the end of the day. Soul Bargain just cycles, so it's not useful, but it's not a completely dead card either. The worst card in the deck is just a Nibble. Just a Nibble is just a flat-out negative card, and usually these games come down to value-centric. Possessed Acolyte, I haven't yet to see the ability to like, ever trigger. Like In, in this format, its ability is rather useless. V-Rock, and then it, there's just a bunch of minions. Everything is 2x except Fellow Protector and Tough Townsfolk, which are 1x each. I'm confused as to why, but <laughs> that, that, that's how it goes. That's how it goes at times, and... Yeah, the, uh, the Eager at Noble Warren is really bad too because it has one health and dies to the Blood Ritual God Power, but this is what we're up against. So me and my opponent in each game, we must play this exact deck. No substitutions. Uh, the deck costs a grand total of five US dollars, and you could have this all to yourself. But anyways, let's just go ahead and get into the matches. You've ha I've talked way too much about this deck already. Welcome to the round of group stage in the Chuck Starter Deck Tournament. We are both required to play the Death Starter Mirror with, well, it's a, it's a customized version of Death Starter and Core Cards type of thing. But we're all we're both, we're both required to play the same deck. So this is another of the Mirror Starter series. This is group play, so it's kind of unique in, in that it's mildly different this deck every card costs three mana or less so that's something to keep in mind as well and maybe i should keep minions because the, the just the nibble's really bad but every card in this deck costs three mana or less and yeah that, that's the format 
these... The, the funny thing is you would think that these would be fast games, but since they're so bad and that you're just kind of, kind of neutralize each other, a lot of times it becomes more longer games of, of attrition. You do want to go first. You do want to win the Sanctum. Winning the Sanctum is huge because, I mean, your main deck is really, really bad. So if you can get the Sanctum, then you're, you're doing very, very good. I'm going to play Hoplite on one. You could argue that the Messenger is better because the 2-3 body is less vulnerable to Axe Woman, which is a card that they're very likely to have. However, I'm thinking that maybe with this we can get some heal value. He just has a Blight Bomb, which also works for the situation. Now we get this out there. And we do have some reactive cards can fight for the board here. The Sanctum, probably the Ranger First Bow is going to be the most effective card in this Sanctum. For this format, I should say. Yeah, this format, that is probably the most effective card. So I'm going to go ahead, make the trade here, see what we get. I think the Blight Bomb is more versatile than the Axe Woman. We get the Felid Protector, which it will come into play this turn. And we're going face, so we're getting a little bit of favor here. Again, the Sanctum is, is really, really important. Going first is the advantage is you do get control of the Sanctum. We've got some board presence here, some Reactionary. And can get the Battle Oryx down next turn with the Blight Bomb, probably preferring that over the V-Rock. Our opponent should be able to play lots of things. And we, yep, we're able to see that's going to make trade successfully for him. And they've got the Blight Bomb to finish this off. So he's played both Blight Bombs this game. So we do not have to worry about Blight Bomb when we play our Battle Oryx here, which we will indeed do. The Possessed Act Light isn't super, super great at this stage of the game. Obviously, you get bonuses when you hit the 15 health. I, it's, it's kind of a catch-22, because if you get down to 15 health, I've probably lost control of the board, and that's probably not very good. So, they've got a V-Rock, and they're going to give my creature Solus, uh, which, at the end of the day, doesn't really matter. I, I, don't, I don't think it does. I mean, I'm not super familiar with the format, but I do not think it does. We're going to draw with the V-Rock, see if we get an Axe Woman to peel this off. And we do. <laughs> that, 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 that was a cool top deck call right there. And we'll probably just play the Dockside Prowler here. Yep, we will indeed. Pretty good start to this game for, from our perspective. Of course, going first is nice. And I think we're going to win the battle, the race, the first thing in the Sanctum, which will be the Ranger First Bow most likely, helps contest the board. And, I mean, the battle does too, but the Ranger First Bow... Co comboed with the gob power can test the board a little bit better in, in my opinion so they're going to be able to buff their minion okay they, that minion is very buff here so the question is, is do i want to trade the oh wait that's end of turn oh boy that card's even worse than i thought so we're able to kind of really expose our opponent on, on this turn here we can use our gp to remove the minion the Ranger First Bow, as I stated before, is going to be able to get more board presence. And yeah, I'll, I'll give Solus to the to the V-Rock, sure. It, it doesn't really matter where I apply it. But we have plenty of board presence. It was a great sign last turn that they had to play the Tough Townsfolk and couldn't get much value out of it, or any value out of that, I should say. So here's a situation where I can play the Panacea Messenger on the Battle Oryx and get a little bit of value here. So this trades here, this trades here. And by trade, I mean lives. They will be able to GP and get rid of it. They are now below 15, which is a magic number for some things in this deck. I will play these two and go ahead and take the ruin because it's the best card on the sanctum i think the next turn we just go face and win pretty much uh even if they've got the even if they've got the possessed acolyte what can they really do here is, is a question and they do indeed have the possessed acolyte and they sh can, can can remove this but we can kill this six eight ten twelve fourteen is lethal i can kill to 14 chat which may or may not surprise some members here but here we go straight towards the face here and we will go ahead and take game number one in our favor again going first in this matchup with the, these two decks that curve out at three 
and getting the early board initiative, I think, is just about everything. And we got that in game number one. We had everything break our way. We'll see if game number two works out just as well. Game number one went our way. No complaints. Got the, got the first turn advantage and got the early initiative. We're getting the first turn advantage here again. It'd be interesting if he goes with another god power. The Nefru Sacrifice one is one that intrigues me. I do like the Shill Maiden as a turn one open. The Hoplite is okay. There's just so many bad cards in, our, in the deck, like just Nibble, that are just completely useless. That when you have a card like Hoplite, even though it's not really, really good, it's not really, really bad. So I feel okay about keeping it in my opening hand. Because it's, it's trading one for one with, I mean, even if it's trading with an Axe Woman or a Blight Bomb, which is mana efficiency for my opponent, it's, it's a useful card. It's not like just a Nibble, which is in this deck as well, which is just completely useless. I mean, the Shield Maiden can die to Blight Bomb as well, but it can't die to Vanguard Axe Woman. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Of course, he should be keeping... Blight Bomb in his opening hand if he if he gets it. It's just a good card. It kills literally anything for one mana. <laughs> and I, I think I think it literally kills everything in bo both decks. Blight Bomb for one mana is very, very strong in this particular format. So it should be a keep if he if he had it, of course. We didn't get it in our opening hand, so there's a chance that he didn't get it. And if he's sitting there with like one mana two twos, then this is a very awkward situation. And, and as soon as I say that, he plays a 1-mana 2-2. Two, two. Again, very awkward situation. Oh, he had the Blight Bomb. That's key for him. That was that was big. And having the Blight Bomb there was huge. Because if, if he didn't have that, I was playing the Panacea and Messenger, and I was running into here. I, I, was, I was running into here, then playing the Messenger, and would have been left with a 2-2 two, two minion. Would have gotten a lot of value there. So him having the Blight Bomb really saved, him, saved himself here. And, and now it's not a horrendous start. So he's getting the Axe Woman. He's going to be able to use the GP. So that worked out very well for him. And now I'm in an awkward spot. I don't want to play the V-Rock or Hoplite into this 2-2. That's just not very great. And I, I don't want to... Yeah, I don't like any of this. See, if I played this, he can still pick... Yeah, this is just mana efficiency. Mana efficiency dumping our hand is, is what we got to focus on here. Next turn, we can play the Spring Bloom and the Hoplite. And that's probably correct. And here, they, they run into here. And we, we will get to draw... Of course, if they've got a, depending on what they have here, they had that three mana three three with front line. It's, it's very very awkward here. Yeah, they're gonna peel there. It makes sense. So we can play the hoplite and the spring bloom. Okay, no, never mind. The blight bomb is big. The blight bomb is indeed very big here. So we can go ahead play the blight bomb. I'm gonna lead with the spring bloom. The idea is, depending on what they play, we've got these eagle noble borns, which we can get some value out of. And I think that's slightly better. Okay, these are just going to end up trading most likely. And he's got the Ralph Ur sign. So the, yeah, we play the Hoplite and they end up trading. Yeah, no no real no real things here. This is probably going to be something very common in this type of format. We kind of have a standstill. Neither one of us are really making progress. And my hand right now is just complete bricks. So I'm curious what he's holding. But these Eagle Nobleborns are just so bad in this in, 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 the, in these games. Because of the Blood Ritual God Power. And the Possessed Acolyte's just a 2 mana 2-2 two, two at the moment. Okay, Raoul Ursine. Not, not super, super effective here. He should be able to play one more minion. And these will likely trade with one of these. Neither one of us really making progress towards the Sanctum. And nothing in the Sanctum is super, super effective. I mean, we do have the Bronze Servant, which is the 3 mana 3-3. Three, three. And I, I, even even with no relics, a three mana three three in this format is solid. I mean, so here is, he can attack or he can sit, but it's probably going to have the same result. Yeah, I, I do agree with attacking. It gives me less options if I have something amazing I can do here. Just a nibble is the worst card in the deck. I don't like seeing that at this stage of the game. And we do get a shield maiden, which can be. A mild nuisance for our opponent here. We can, he can see him attack here and use the GP, but he still has three mana left over. At the moment, I think we're losing. We have, I mean, we've actually traded seven cards. Well, actually, no, he's he's gotten a little bit of card advantage. Yeah, he's he's achieved a little bit of card advantage because he played Soul Bargain. Um, so that's where he currently stands. 
But yeah, and our hand right now is just horrendous. The Eagle Noble board is completely useless. And yeah, that that is effective. It's, it stops me dead in my tracks here. All we can do is play these two, and it doesn't really accomplish much. Again, I want to play the Eagle Noverborn when I can get some sort of use out of it. And honestly, I might end up playing both in the same turn, so they can only GP one of them. That's a common strategy in these type of uh, events. But the, we've got three effectively dead cards in hand. These are moderately dead. Justin Nibble was just flat out dead. This is definitely the worst card in the entire deck. I hope he's holding two of them. <laughs> but he, he might not be. But the, the, the moment... Of course, everything in his deck costs three or less. Everything in my deck costs three or less. So we know he's holding a lot of things that he can play right now. At the, at the moment, it just seems like we're kind of at a standstill. Dude, there's not really any benefit of going face. This is really all about value at the end of the day. And, yep. Yeah, Achieving more value. I guess I can't go buy cards in Void because of the soulless thing. Yeah, maybe we've been trading the entire time. I was trying to think of where I lost out on, and this part is not so clear to me. So I'm going to lose a card. If, I'm going to lose a card in card efficiency here. But we will do this. Do this. I'm going to play both Eagle Noble Boards for board presence. The reason being is he can only GP one of them. And I think that's the best deal I'm going to get. I'm going to press forward some damage here. And I can make a Sanctum purchase right now. But I'm going to elect not to. We might purchase this Enraged Ally. Or we may go for the Bronze Servant. So he can GP one of these Eagle Noble Boards. That is uh, Eager. Not Eagle. Eager. 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 Not Eagle. There you go. Eager. So he, he's able to get that off the board. He's going to be able to get one of these off the board. Now, does he play anything? One line here is to actually sit and say that it doesn't matter that we're taking off time. you got to be a little bit careful because I can buy the wind-up roller and, a, and, and theoretically flood the board. So does he play anything which will let me kind of trade into him? Or does he just flat out sit here? There, there is a lot of merit to just sitting. <laughs> this is how stupid the format is, is. He can just sit here. Doesn't want me to trade here. He's got three cards in hand. I have effectively zero. Just a nibble is flat out useless. In fact, you could argue that one of the best use cases for just a nibble for me next turn is to prevent him from GPing to gain favor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy the wind-up roller with the idea that, hey, I want to flood the board this turn. And uh, we get the tough townsfolk. So this is controversial, but I'm using the GP on the Eager Noble Born. The, the reason being is if he uses the GP, he gains three favor. He's got seven mana, so it's not really an issue of, of, of mana or anything like that. Just getting getting rid of that prevents an opportunity for him to gain favor. And that's 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 what I was denying there on that line. Yep, now we're seeing him flood the board. He wants to ask some questions with the line that I just did. And now we've got uh, some things to consider here. So this hits here. I would like to leave myself with two one health minions. But this might not end up working. Okay, so if I hit... If I hit here... Hit here, GP. Hit here, GP, face, face, then they peel, peel. Hit here, GP. Hit here. Hit here. 
And now he can attack here, but he can only GP this minion. This lives, but doesn't get much value. This goes back to a 2-3. He had a good burst turn there. Really worked out that really worked out well. Maybe I made a mistake killing the eager nobleborn. Should have just let him have the three favor. That might have been a mistake. Now he can grab the battle orcs, which is the best card in the sanctum at the moment, and he does indeed do so. And we are behind in this game in terms of value, and they do give us a little bit of value back by allowing us to hit the vanguard axe woman. So. We'll go ahead, draw a card. Yeah, the double Justin Nibble is just really, really tough at this stage of the game. These are just the worst cards. You just don't want to end up with Justin Nibble in your hand. It's just so bad. And the Battle Oryx. Now he has complete control of this game, complete control of the Sanctum, and he can flood the board and just get, get value. So really drawing the two Justin Nibbles, I think, was kind of the turning point in this one. Just very unfortunate. So now we enter game number three. We went first in the first two. I'm starting to think that it might not matter as much. You just don't want to draw just a nibble. Nifru sacrifice a thing here. It might be. But Blood Ritual does help contest the board, and there's they do have the eager noble borns, which get value if you don't take that. This draw isn't bad. I'm going to get rid of the V-Rock. Spring Bloom's a great T1. It asks the question if they have Blight Bomb or not. I'm going to keep it. I mean, it's, it's three non-useless cards. Mol Usually what ends up happening is all these cards end up trading one for one. So that's fine. We can get the Spring Bloom out on one, maybe get a Hoplite out on turn two. If we can win the early board, that could be key. We get just a nibble. See, see, this card is just absolutely devastating when you draw it, because it has no utility whatsoever. So we're, we're already down a card. I feel like we're already losing, and the game has just started. This unfortunately has hidden, so I can't really get much value here. I have to play Hoplite and let him trade. Which is kind of sad. Not much I can do there, though. Because if, if we do nothing, they can just do this and this, and then doing nothing just effectively trades. We did pick up two favor. Uh, the Sanctum, nothing much in the Sanctum. <sighs> okay, so the Axe Woman plus the GP kills this. Is still trading three mana for three mana, so effectively it's a wash. We do pick up a little bit of favor with this going face, though. That is going to be somewhat annoying, and this can go in with this and this and get value. We will soul bargain. Yeah, so they will attempt to attack here into here, and they're 50-50 to hit here, 25% to hit here and hit here. The hit here, then our GP can finish here, but then they can get the Eager Noble Born out there, and then maybe I float a turn. Oh, they're doing this. So this is 50-50 face or, or not. It does hit there. So we, but we can still hit here and hit the form of power or the card shark or the rune of sight. They should play a minion here. I can't think of a reason not to. Yeah, okay. So they just didn't want to play it because they're like, if I get to 15 health, but you never get to 15 health here. So we are getting the first pick in the Sanctum. We take the form of power. I think it's the best card. It's not a great card, but it's something. And just trying to keep some sort of board presence. We would like to win the race for the Ranger first bow. So we got a card from the Sanctum, which means that it kind of makes up for having just a nibble, which is just a complete dead card. It's completely useless. He Blight Bombs there. We Blight Bomb here. We're all big one Blight Bomby family. 
he is the the ranger first bow is the best card in the sanctum because of the value you, you stick a minion as well so there is some value associated with the ranger first bow okay hoplite this uses the most mana and that's why we elect to play these two minions i could have played the battle orcs but then he attacks uses the gp and he can immediately buy the ranger first bow now we're at least asking a little bit of questions there's some lines where we can actually win the race to the 13 favor mark especially with battle oryx and then maybe being forced to trade you can lead with v rock potentially get something like a blight bomb really contest the board here though it's actually very hard for us to get to 13 favor because if he has one favor moment he gets to 13 and we actually need to accomplish three favor moments to get to, to to get there so yeah we need to accomplish three favor moments he only needs to accomplish one so these these two just have to trade okay he's getting out the eager noble born here which we're gonna have a gp and get one favor moment <laughs> I don't like playing this into this because they just get a lot of value. So we're just going to hit here and pass. I know he can peel here. If he can, if he blight bombs here, he really wrecks us because he can do this, 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 and this. But I, I have to ask the question, and that's as effective as a blight bomb. So he can GP here, and he can attack here. Or well, actually, no, he can just no. He can't. He can't buy the ranger first bow and play it. So it wasn't the same as a blight bomb. But the Ranger First Bow is indeed the best card in the Sanctum, and he should definitely snap it right now. If he doesn't snap it, I'm snapping it. <laughs> he might buy the Card Shark because he's like, I can play it the same turn. Rune of Sight, yeah. See, the problem with Rune of Sight is you're drawing from this deck. <laughs> and uh, this deck is really, really bad. <laughs> and, and that's why Rune of Sight is not very, very good, is because this deck is so bad that you're drawing from this deck. We draw Blight Bomb, which is literally the best card in the deck we could have drawn here we peel here and the best card in the sanctum is indeed the ranger first but i'm just i'm not wait, wasting time i'm just buying it okay rune of fire rune of fire and bronze servant are about the same tier in the sanctum though you could argue that this costs two less mana but situationally the rune of fire makes more sense i assume the v-rock's gonna die here he did play yeah, he's going to play Rune of Sight. So the, the, what you want to see on Rune of Sight is just a nibble. So you can put it at the bottom of your deck. <laughs> that way you don't don't draw it. It's just a completely dead card. So we, we're, we're it already feels like we're disadvantaged by one card because we have Rune of Sight. Uh, just a nibble in hand. Of course, he could easily have just a nibble in hand as well. It's just so, so bad. Okay, he has the Blight Bomb there. No surprise. And we can play a lot of things. All right, here the Ranger First Bow comes onto the board alongside the GP. We can play these two as well. I know that he can peel here, but our GP finishes off here. This would be a good turn for him to play an eager nobleborn because this would be left with one health and he could kill this the eager nobleborn i can only remove one with the god power but we are gaining some board initiative here he will have one favor moment this turn exactly and he'll have another favor moment this turn so it'll be up to 11 favor one card left in his hand is probably just a nibble. Oh, it is. And he flat out plays it to prevent me from having the favor moment, which I actually think is the correct line. It's just such, it's, it's so weird, but I think it's correct. Unfortunately for him, he's out of cards and I've got four on board. So we're winning the value, <laughs> value this game. And that was not a good top deck for him because I, yeah. And he concedes. So, yeah, these decks are kind of cringe. But we get the win in our first game of group stage. And we'll see what happens in the next one.
Welcome to the starter deck tournament. We're still in group stage. This is my second game of group stage. We won the first one, well, second match of group stage. We won the first match. And here we are playing another match. And once again, going first. We went first in all four games last time around. So continuing the trend here. Good opening hand. We'll keep so, yeah, going first every single game is good strategy. Ideally, if we can seize the early board control, then that's going to be very good. If we can get the Sanctum, even though the Sanctum is really bad to start this game. Very bad Sanctum. So, our advantage will be probably a little bit less because of that. The Rune of Sight is the best card in the Sanctum. The Fellow Tracker is completely useless, and the Ruin of Life is essentially useless. So two of the three cards of the Sanctum are pretty useless, which decreases the advantage of coming out early with a lot of speed. So that's one thing to keep in mind moving forward in this match here. Alright, so these two end up trading one drop for one drop here. And that is fine. I, mean, I can I can play the messenger, but then we allow this attack. I can actually GP here, and then he could GP here and trade. There's there's multiple different ways of playing this. I think utilizing the GP as much as possible is going to be very important in this match. But at, at this stage, just trading a tough townsfolk for a Vanguard Axe Woman. I think is a positive trade in quality overall. I mean, I, I still think it might have been correct what they did that turn because it's just so awkward for me to take all two of my mana and, and blood ritual there. Yeah, trading there makes sense because they don't want me to allow, allow to get the attack of value in here. Let's go ahead and execute the Blight Bomb. Getting a little bit of favor here moving forward is, is ideal. We are... I mean, we would prefer to have the Ruin of Sight in the Sanctum, but we've got 8 favor to their 0, so spending 15 on that is, is going to be something that we can do. Uh, the idea is that when you 4C, you hope to put some of those just a nibbles down on the bottom of the deck. Th those are really the only two absolute bricks that are included in this list, and we want to do everything we can to avoid them. Easy attack decision there. An easy attack decision here. Though you could have argued that it was slightly less mana efficient to what I did there than just playing the, the Spring Bloom and giving up this. But we do accomplish more favor with this route. Wind Up Roller is going to be the best card in the Sanctum. Now, I think that this game it might all, all the way, all, all, always be about that top Sanctum pick. So Wind Up Roller... Right now, the top Sanctum pick. And because the, these two, the, the, especially the Fellow Tracker, is just going to be absolutely useless here. So let's just get out two minions to put some board presence out there. And this minion's kind of awkward because you can't just play a 2 2 while this is out there and get good value, I should say. Yeah, Soul Bargain is just a card that just cycles for itself. It's. Not the worst card in the deck, but it, the, the giving something soulless effectively does nothing. So it does basically cost you one mana the turn that you play it. But besides that, it's not a completely dead tempo card. The Just to Nibble is the worst card, and we are fortunate so far to have not drawn that. And our opponent is taking a little bit of damage. We have our eyes on the wind-up roller, the V-Rock will get us to draw, and we draw said Justin Nibble. So if I had Rune decided last turn, I could have put that at the bottom of my deck, and I would have felt like a genius. Instead, we feel like not a genius. Okay, the Raoul Ursine, definitely a card that we can play this turn. We're going to go ahead and take a peek, sees at the Ruin of Sight here. Like, neither of those is, is, is really bad or really, really good at, at the same point. So I'm going to put both at the bottom here. And, okay, we get we get that. 
we'll go ahead and see how this trade works because I think this minion is just overall better because it can get more value in certain situations and we're going to be able to flood the board with two minions here. They should be able to flood the board potentially here as well. I'm hoping that they're holding a Justin Nibble so they have one dead card in their hand as well. As long as we're making even trades or positive trades, we, we think that we're winning in this game. There's also two mana, two ones, which are really, really bad. So for, for our rune of sight uh, that we, we played, we did draw a card, but we didn't cycle out any of the negative cards. So we, it doesn't really feel like we accomplished anything. Now here, they have a very good turn because we can't deal with both of them in a very convenient fashion. We will go ahead and give up this minion, remove this. They could actually potentially pick up some value with the Ruin and the Sanctum. We've drawn our second just a nibble, so we have both the dead cards. It's very unfortunate. So, yeah, don't like having these. These are just flat-out dead cards. We're actually on pace to get the next Sanctum pick, which will indeed be the wind-up roller. Not surprised to see that attack here. This is a great opportunity for our opponent to play two ones, or there you go. They get value out of that. Very effective line there. Works out very good for my opponent. So here, this turn, this goes into here, and then this is going to buff here, which allows us to hit here and get value out of this minion, which is often just a completely dead card. I'm going to try for the Riled Earth sign to hit here. It's actually the worst if it goes face. Okay, it didn't go face. If it goes face, then they can get those Acolytes in play and start getting value out of them, which can be very problematic. I will buy the wind-up roller. It's the best card in the Sanctum. And the Sanctum could cycle into something useless. It cycles into something that's not useless, though. Okay, yep. Blood Ritual on there is what we expected, but we effectively traded it one for one because this minion did live. So we're we're happy, we're happy to get some value out of that one. That's a specific card that you you're not always able to successfully get value out of. Here, I fully expect him to play the Shield Maiden and attempt to trade the Wild Ursine here into here. They miss on their attack. I'm assuming they missed. So now, if they could get like a 3-3 three, three in play, that's what they would want to do. A 1-3 is the worst front line that they could get. Now we're going to have a 50-50 to attack into here and get a plus 1 value in terms of card differential. But let's go ahead and play the wind-up roller first to see if we get something to guarantee this attack, and we do not. I will attempt it. Now, I'm going I'm to use reverse psychology. I think this dude, this dude looks like a bear that's not going to listen. I was incorrect. He was a bear that listened. All right. I have the option of using my GP to deny them favor, or I can play the Dockside Prowler and try to just get more board presence and gain favor. That's what we're going to do. We're going to play the Dockside Prowler. So this turn, they can GP the Riled Earth sign, which is the best line. And here they're able to get value out of the Eagle Noble board to trade that minion up, which they were probably going to lose anyways. So that was a very successful turn for them. And, yep, they're able to get this, the Blight Bomb out there. And they have only one card in their hand. So at most, they have one Just a Nibble. They've done a good job of avoiding the Just a Nibble. Unfortunately, we've drawn, unfortunately, we have drawn both of ours. Uh, they're definitely the worst card that you can get in this format. Have they gotten any of those Acolytes yet? They could be holding back on the Acolytes. These two mana 2-2s two I just tossed out there because I wanted some board initiative early. But if they can get some 6-6s six out of those, you're really accomplishing something. So we have to be very careful when we put them below 15 health. That is one thing that we have to note in, in this game. They have nine cards left in their deck. In fact, it's probably going to be best for me to be very, very patient 
in, in, in the turns moving forward in this game. Because it, it, we don't really need to rush to get them down. We just want to outvalue them. Of course, going face is a great way to get Sanctum favor. So there is that. Okay, pretty good. Pretty good turn for them, getting both of these in play. So what I'm going to do here is peel here. Peel here. This lets us... This allows us to grab the Vow of Champions from the Sanctum, which we can use to just remove the Dockside Prowler for now. If we don't kill the minion, they can attack and use Blood Ritual, so we're simply, simply protecting our minion. This is super awkward for two twos and stuff. The Battle Oryx does appear in the Sanctum. We can attack here and use the GP. And it is what it is. We've got eight cards left in our deck. They've got seven left in theirs. And they play the Possessed Acolyte, which is interesting. I was a little bit concerned if they held that back, if we would be able to kind of deal with that situation. Unfortunately, we don't pick up an Axe Woman or... Any, any sort of thing to potentially punish this minion. We do are unable to punish it. I have the option of playing the 3-3 three, three or the 2-3 this turn. Since mana is not really an object at this point, is not really a thing at this point, I'm going to go, go with this because I think either way, if I play the Battle Oryx or the Shield Maiden, they're just attacking and using the GP. I, I don't see another thing that they're really doing. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to attack, use the GP. We're actually happy with that. We get rid of one of their possessed acolytes. I was slightly worried about getting them to 15 because they had not played one yet and could have easily been holding them back as kind of a strategy, something to keep in mind. But they've got a Spring Bloom Hunter. So here's a situation where I can go face, put them at 16, and potentially get to the Ruin of Strength a little bit quicker. I think that's going to be the line here. So we, we don't put them at the magic number, which is 15. They're likely to do this attack and then GP here, which is fine. But then that gives us to the 15 favor mark. And if we've got 15 favor, we could potentially... Make V-Rock just super, super big. Which could be very helpful. Again, this is another situation where we're looking at the Fellow Tracker and the Rune of Life just being the dead, useless cards in the Sanctum. This game may come down to fatigue, which is intriguing. For the very least. But they're, they're going to run out of cards before us, it looks like. Well, actually, two of our, I think two of our cards are the Give Something Soulless. Yeah, we've got two of those left, so maybe we run out first. Of course, if those are the bottom two cards of the deck, you just, you just kind of let it float at the end of the day. Okay, they're using just a nibble to heal. I mean, I think, I think we're happy with that, actually. We're, we're happy with that because, okay, Soul Bargain. I'm going to go ahead and just apply the pressure here. Maybe I should, yeah, I should, I should have done this first, but either way. And that's why you do that first. We will apply the pressure, ask the question to our opponent here. So hypothetically, they could have the Possessed Acolyte, but they use the GP, they play the Possessed Acolyte. We could still go phase for nine which is really asking some questions to our opponent. Again, I'm not super surprised to see the Acolyte. I guess now they get value out of just a nibble. So that, yeah, eager. So he's just, he's just G, GP here. Did he forget? He forgot to GP that turn. Yeah, he could have just God-powered here. 
I honestly don't know why he didn't. These two will go face. I'd like to use the gob power here. Heal this up. And I don't know of any out here that saves him. I mean, this produces a 6 6 minion, but he's got one card, and these decks, there's no Apocalypse now. You have to, you have to play around. Let's just put it that way. Put it kindly, there's no Apoc now. We have to worry about another front line. They get a 6 6. They can kill this, but this goes into here. GP takes this out, frees up the V Rock to go to the face, and a, a grueling. 15 plus minute game number one is going to go our way. Actually, going into 16 minutes as he's hitting the rope here, he's thinking, I guess, about the fellow tracker, which is the only card that he can buy. But that fellow tracker doesn't sur survive him in this situation. We go to the face, claim the win in game number one, and yeah, we, we got the early advantage from going first, and we were able to convert that. After a grueling game number one, which lasted almost 16 minutes, we're going into game number two. That game almost came down to fatigue. Very close. In this format, the decks are designed that you have a lot of one-for-one -one trades. So any moment where you can get a, just a tad bit of value, you're really feeling like you're accomplishing something. So that's one thing to keep a note of. We're going first here. Wild Ursine is three mana. Okay, we can get this out on one with this potential... That could be big with the Blight Bomb to back it up. I like it. The, the main thing is we don't want just a Nibble, okay? That's the worst card in the deck. That's the card we want to avoid. So opening with Shield Maiden on turn one. What I like about this open is if they play like a one mana 2-2 two, two here, then we can attack and then we can Panacean, uh, Panacean Messenger. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, we've got... This is a mana awkward play, but I'm doing this because I think... That there are some lines where I can get a two for one situation where if they play a two two, I can attack, then heal the minion. And keeping the Blight Bomb back is, is effective too. I could have traded and then and then just played the Panacea, which would have been fair, but that is it is what it is. Looking at the Sanctum, one mana two two is a one mana two two. Athenian Archer is very strong in, in this in this format as well. So probably leaning toward the archer if I have my pick in the sanctum. But you don't always get your pick in the Sanctum. Our opponent able to successfully remove our 2-3 with an Axe Woman. They played, that, they played that line very well. You don't want to just leave the question on the board. So I, I think they did that correctly here. Now here we're hoping they've got like a 1-mana 2-2 two two or something that we can attack into. And then you get value with the Panacean Messenger. That's what we want to happen. But that's not all, what always does end up happening. We know last turn they used the Axe Woman and then pipped out their GP here, which tells me that most likely, well, they've got another Axe Woman. So I was going to say, most likely they don't have a super clean answer to the situation, but they indeed had a clean enough answer to the situation. And it looks like, okay, the tough townsfolk getting on the board now. We will be able to get the Spring Bloom and the Panacean out there. These two could go into here and potentially grab some value. We've got the Blight Bomb for anything bigger they put behind this. So this Tough Townsfolk is, is actually somewhat tough to get value out of, especially going second from, from our opponent's perspective. And we might be winning the race for the Athenian Archer, the Athenian Archer being the clear number one best card in the Sanctum, in my opinion. All right, so this turn we have the opportunity to use the Blight Bomb on a great target to get a 3-3 off the board. The region gains value here. We go straight towards the face, grab the Athenian Archer. The Athenian Archer is indeed the best card in the Sanctum. We hate seeing that we have just a nibble in our hand, but we're hoping that we can replace the ne basically negative one card we have in our hand with card advantage from the Sanctum, which will let us get ahead in this game. So we, we're, we're minus one with the cards that we've drawn from our hand, but we're plus one in the Sanctum. They've got a seven favor edge on us right now, but we have the initiative and may be able to capitalize on that. So we're, eight, we're, we're able to see the V-Rock come down. The Eager Noble board is, is a very bad card, I would have to say, just generally speaking. And they have a Hoplite as well. 
All right, so we'll just trade off one of our two twos here. This is kind of a standard a standard idea. We're going to use the the GP here as well. Get some value out of that, and we're already peeling back some value in the favor race. We've already gotten enough favor. We have enough. We're probably going to win the race for the next best item in the Sanctum, which is indeed the Ranger First Bow. So we're situated pretty nicely right here, I would have to say. Got, got a good start in this game. A better start than we had last game. And last game, we, we went first and had the initiative. This game, we're, we're going first, have the initiative, and have an even better start. Unfortunately for them, playing that 2-3 with the Spring Bloom Hunter on the board, we're going to be able to attack and use the GP, get value, and we're going to be able to pick up the Ranger First Bow from the Sanctum, which is not going to feel very good for our opponent. So let's go ahead with this line as planned. The Ranger First Bow is indeed the best card of the Sanctum, so that is what we're going to acquire. And then I'm going to just play the Battle Oryx, and let's give souls to this this guy. And okay, yeah, this is this is fine. This is this is this is absolutely fine. So they can they can attack and use the GP. They go up to eleven favor. It's actually uh, actually probably favored to win the win the race for the next card on the Sanctum. It's, it's this, this game's have been pretty much all about the Sanctum. The Sanctum is our second hand, and it's very difficult for our opponent. Just being behind in the initiative with us c controlling the Sanctum the entire game, it's just a bit unfair. We can potentially get value with the eager, eager Noble Board next turn. Even if they get the Possessed Acolytes in play, I think I just ignore them, go face, and just win the race. We've already got four wide established on the board here. They've passed. What they, what they want me to do is they want me to go towards their face and put them below 15. And I can really put them on tilt by simply doing this attack and being incredibly patient here. There's no reason to put them below 15 at the moment. And there's no way they can deal damage to their god. So putting them at 16 for one more turn allows us to pick off things they play this turn and then push as much damage to the face as possible. So like hypothetically, since he just passed last turn, we just said, okay, we're going to deal four to you, expand our board, and then ask you the question of what you're going to do. Now, it's, it's incredibly awkward. They can't pass this turn. They take 11 and then they die before they ever get the six sixes. You could have argued that I should have put him at 13 anyways, but I thought that his best chance to climb back into the game would be to play two possessed acolytes, maybe have them start dying and get value that way. But yeah, here we're just going to go ahead like this. Everything goes to the face here. They can peel peel my minion if they would like. But they are incredibly low on health. And it's not looking good for them. They're at 5 already. We have the Rune of Fire in hand. I don't see a legit way for them to survive. They don't see a legit way for them to survive. And we win our second match of group play. So we ended up winning the group, finishing in first place. That advances us to the round of 64. Now's when I get to the point of the video where I talk about stuff that I'm curious, what if things went a little bit differently. So I, the, my, the person I played in the first round beat the person I played in the second round of the group stage. The way it worked out was very simple. I went 2-0, and they went 1-1, one and one, and the other person went 0-2. Oh you have a clear first, a clear second place advance. However, what would have happened if I would have lost my last game? Lots of tie-breaking procedures, do three people advance? How does that work? Because we would have all, in theory, had a two win and one loss record, and they're advancing the top two. I don't understand what they would have done in that exact scenario. Another interesting thing I saw from the bracket side of things is the way they structure the bracket. Now, they wanted to make this World Cup style. For those of you who are familiar with the World Cup, which just happened very recently, when you're in the same group with somebody, after you're done with the group, one person gets the winner's 
poor winner slot of the group, one person gets the loser slot of the group, and they go to the opposite side of the bracket. Well, me and my first round opponent ended up kind of pretty close to each other on the bracket. Not like immediately close, but we could, in theory, meet in, I believe, the round of 16 if we both make it there, which is interesting. <laughs> interesting how the bracket kind of worked out, but... I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. I don't know if they thought that process through. Did they just randomly throw us in this specific spot? I'm curious how the process worked, and I honestly don't know how. All I know is I'm in the round of 64 now, and I know where the bracket is. I know where the other person in my group got slotted. I don't think they had another game either. I think they got a buy into the round of 64 also, so I guess maybe that match wasn't super, super important. But it would have been interesting if I had lost my second match and then all three of the people who showed up were tied, how they would have handled that situation. Because honestly, I don't know. Anything could have happened. <laughs> but anyways, that's going to end this video. I'll see you on the next video as we go on and advance to the round of 64.